Uh, good morning and uh, welcome. My name is Robert Roser and I am a member of the ISCS 2016 Planning Committee and it's my great delight and honor to welcome you and to introduce my friend and colleague uh, Geshe Tupin Jimpala. As many of you are aware, Jimpa is the uh, chairman of the board of the Mind and Life Institute. He's an adjunct professor at McGill University and has been the primary translator for His Holiness the Dalai Lama since 1985. Uh, Jimpala received his uh, monastic training and Geshe Laram degree uh, from Shartse College in Gandan Monastery in South India. He has assisted uh, His Holiness in editing and translating many books, as you're aware, and is also a significant scholar of Tibetan studies in his own right. He has created the Cultivating Compassion Training Program in conjunction um, with colleagues at Stanford University, and recently he's published a beautiful book called A Fearless Heart, A Compassion being compassionate can transform our lives. Uh, he lives in Montreal with his wife Sophie and his two daughters, and I think um, there's not a more timely, uh, there is not a more significant time for the message of having a fearless heart. So please join me in welcoming Geshe La to Benjimpala. Morning. Um, although I've been part of Mind and Life for now almost 30 years, actually this is the first international symposium of contemplative studies that I'm myself actually participating. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first one um, took place when His Holiness was traveling, so I had to, of course, uh, assist him as his interpreter. And then the second one, um, the keynote uh, session was with His Holiness, a conversation with His Holiness and Richie. So again, there I was in my capacity as an interpreter. Then, you know, after His Holiness moved on to another city, I also left. So this is the first real, you know, international symposium for me. Although it's the third one for Mind and Life. And at the beginning, I would like to express my deep appreciation to Mind and Life Institute and particularly the planning committee members for inviting me to give this master lecture. Um, I've chosen this particular topic. Um, can I have the slide now? Um, understanding the psychology behind compassion meditation. Um, because what I see today uh, is kind of a, what we might call the second phase of what journalists refer to as the mindful revolution. Um, increasingly, we see compassion playing a, a major role and also becoming a major focus in this new field, contemplative science, uh, which attempts to integrate you know, scientific research with contemplative practice with the aim of developing applications in real world situations and areas such as healthcare, education, workplace, and general well-being, and so on. So part of this movement um, you know, can be really seen in the story of how mindfulness came to be so, such an important part of the cultural kind of phenomenon. So we see similar kind of phenomenon within the, in the area of compassion as well. Um, while there is a continuing interest from the scientific research community, particularly from the clinical world and basic scientists, and psychologists, at the same time, there is a growing presence of what one might call secularized versions of compassion training program, somewhat analogous to the emergence of MBSR developed by my colleague on the Mind and Life board for a long time, John kabat So today, there are uh, compassion training programs that are secularized, such as Stanford Compassion cultivation training, which I had the privilege to you know, help uh, develop it. There's Margaret Cullen here, who is one of the co-authors of that program. 
um, and Erica Rosenberg and Kelly McGonagall were the three senior teachers who assisted me in finalizing that particular program. There is, um, Emory has a CBCT, uh, cognitive-based uh, compassion therapy, uh, no, compassion training, and um, there is also uh, uh, San Diego, University of San Diego, California San Diego, mindful compassion training, and John Markansky, who has been offering contemplative practice here in some of the sessions, he has developed what used to be called innate compassion, but now I think Nordisty calls it sustainable compassion. So basically, there are emergence of growing in numbers of these kind of programs, and many of you are familiar with uh, loving kindness meditation practice, which Sharon Salzberg really pioneered and made it much more general. So these are important programs that are out there. Alongside this growing presence is also a growing body of scientific research that is coming out from the clinical side, from the basic neuroscience side, from, from the, in the education domain, and so on. Uh, our, I was privileged to be part of uh, Stanford CCARE, uh, Center for Compassion and Altruism Research in Education. I was one of the founding members of that entity, which is part of the Stanford Neuroscience Institute. Um, the CCARE has organized a couple of these international conferences on science, uh, science of compassion. And in fact, a, a book is coming out with Oxford University Press, which puts together a collection of latest scientific findings on, on studies of compassion. So I think it's a growing field. So the time is right to really ask this kind of question, step back and try to say, what are we talking about? What kind of practice? Because one of the backlash against the mindfulness movement have been particularly the critical question, what is the phenomenon here? And what is the definition of the construct? And what is mindfulness? And what is the connection between what we see as modern versions of mindfulness and the Buddhist traditional you know, practices focused on mindfulness? What is the connection? Are they the same? Is mindfulness that is being presented in the modern version the same as what in the Pali tradition refers to as sati, or in Sanskrit, smriti, or Tibetan, tempanyesha? So the, these questions come up. Uh, so, um, so that's why I chose this. Um, so then the question is, you know, what exactly are the targets of these kind of practices? You know, what is the theory of change implicit in this practice? And a lot of people ask me in the gym, when I give general public talks, um, they ask me, you know, they're confused. They say, what is the difference between mindfulness and compassion? And there is also the question, does one presuppose the other or does one include the other? You know, last evening in the keynote dialogue between Richie and Matula, Matthew actually made the case that in fact, compassion includes mindfulness. And it reminds me of a, a, a very memorable passage from one of the Tibetan masters, this is the Kadamba master, who said that, um, you know, a, a spiritual practitioner, a Buddhist, he's talking about Mayan, a Buddhist practitioner, who is committed to compassion and altruism should really focus all his or her energy on cultivating this altruistic thought. And once he has it, then he, the, this teacher says that it will take care of accumulating the good karmas. It will take care of you know, purifying the negative karma. <laughs> Even when you are sleeping, it's working. So it reminded me of that. Um, so I think in order to respond to some, some of these questions, we really need to have some basic understanding of what exactly is the psychology behind these kind of practices. So what I will do is I will, as an example, I will give a, a very brief description of the Stanford uh, Compassion Training, the uh, CCT, what are the key elements, and then using that as the basis, I want to contrast it between what is happening in the actual traditional Buddhist cultivation of compassion so that we have a way of seeing it. Uh, it reminds me of a, a, a beautiful saying by the uh, 13th century uh, Tibetan master Sakya Pandita, he says that uh, even though we have eyes to see others, we need a mirror to see our own face. So often by drawing contrast, you begin to have a better appreciation of what exactly is it that you're looking at. Um, so, sorry, let me go back. 
I'm not still very good with these PowerPoints. So what I will do is I will actually list the key elements that are part of the Stanford Compassion Training. So the first element is what we call settling the mind, but it's a very broad umbrella term we use for types of basic skills that are associated with meditation, being able to relax your mind, being able to pay attention, being able to have this meta cognitive awareness that Zindel Siegel was talking about. So these are part and parcel of basic mindfulness type practices. So in Stanford Compassion Training, that's really the first uh, element and the first step. Second is um, a loving kindness meditation for a loved one. So this is a very modern approach. I will get to that later, why I call it very modern approach. And then third element is self-compassion practice. Again, this is a modern element. You know, one has to be cognizant of that. Um, but in fact, it turns out to be so important in the secularized version that in Stanford Compassion Training, we have two weeks dedicated to the self-compassion. We break it into two components. One is more focused on self-acceptance, self-kindness, and then the next week is focused more on loving kindness to oneself. Um, and then the next element is what we call common humanity practice. Many of you who are familiar and have listened to kind of guided compassion meditations will know this phrase, just like me. You know, he wants to be happy. He doesn't want problems, just like me. So that's the common humanity practice. Again, this is, we, it's an umbrella term, but the, again, there are two elements in there, which it's, it, this is split into two weeks. And then the next element is compassion for others. Now we're expanding our circle of concern. You know, once we have made the connection, then we expand and include strangers, difficult people, and so on. Oh. And then the final element is what we call active compassion, but this is Tonglen. Um, so it's, the idea is that now that you have generated compassion, you are trying to prime yourself to, to, to actually express it in your behavior. And then in the middle of this is intention setting. It's not really listed as one of the elements because it doesn't have a separate week to itself, but because this particular program is really based and draws inspiration from the Tibetan tradition in general and particularly the Lojong, the mind training uh, instruction. In, um, therefore, in the mind training instruction, intention setting is a very, very important part of the practice, of the whole spiritual enterprise, actually. So for all of these elements, which are split into eight weeks, every session, the guided meditation sessions, actually begins with an intention setting. So this is a really such an important point that we put it in the middle. So when we look at a program like this, you know, um, it's, it's inspired by the Buddhist you know, contemplative practice. So the question is, how does the Buddhist tradition itself understand these kind of practices to be working? Um, I think it's, it's, and as I said before, um, it, one way of getting a better clarity is to ask the contrast between the two approaches. And the important contrast is really the context, the framework, and the purpose. Now, in the Buddhist traditional Buddhist context, compassion meditation is always part of a larger soteriological framework, which is part of a, you know, a path to enlightenment. You know, Buddhist practitioners were not looking at these kind of contemplative practices to make them feel better or happier or having a more richer relationship or healthier mind. They were really interested in much more transcendental kind of, you know, goals. And compassion training is really part of that, you know, practice. In fact, compassion training, compassion meditation in the Tibetan or the Indian Mahayana Buddhist tradition is, in fact, a kind of a, a means to a greater goal, which is the cultivation of bodhicitta, which is the altruistic aspiration to attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. So it's, compassion meditation is always part of that larger project. So it's a very, very different. And furthermore, when in the Buddhist traditional context, when people talk about compassion meditation, they actually mean great compassion. They mean not, you know, non-differentiated, unbiased, universal compassion for all beings. 
So they're actually talking about something quite elevated and quite an advanced form. So it's a, it's a different goal. Therefore, in a sense, one could say that the, one of the goals in the compassion training in the Buddhist context is to really develop our character that we, are all, we almost become like a kind of a saintly you know, person, this totally selfless, altruistic being. In the secular context, I don't think those are the goals. And I can't speak for the developers of other secularized compassion training because I can speak for the CCT because I happen to be the main author of this particular program. <laughs> so I, you know, I have access to my own intention. So I can you know, share with you that the goals in the secularized compassion training programs were much more modest, less ambitious. A large part of that is really motivated by personal development practice, something that would aim to create a kind of a, a, a healthy mental life, a more balanced emotional life, and have a deeper relationship with the people who are important in our life, and hopefully become a more ethical and kind person. Really, the, 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 the goals are much more modest in, 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 uh, in the secular version. So I think it's very important to know this because choose, you know, depending on what kind of goals you choose, it's going to influence the kind of criteria we will have to judge whether a particular practice is effective or successful or not. If we set the goal of the traditional Buddhist practices, then many of the secular programs will fall way short of their you know, uh, target. Whereas if our goal is much more realistic and modest, then of course we, can, we will have a much more realistic criteria of what constitutes success and whether something is working or not. So I think understanding that difference is really important. And in the secular versions, there is very little soteriological framework. You know, that doesn't preclude someone using the secularized version to really you know, integrate with one's own spiritual practice. If you're a Buddhist, use the secularized version, but put it within the framework of the larger soteriological project of seeking enlightenment. If you're a Christian, you can incorporate this. Uh, Andrew is here um, from, um, I don't know whether he's in this hall, but um, over there, he, he has developed a, a, a kind of, you know, um, uh, Christian-inspired compassion training, which takes you know, many of the elements that are part of this larger unit secularized version. So the secularized programs will not preclude them, the possibility of integrating, but in themselves, they are really much more neutral when it comes to the larger transcendental kind of soteriological objectives. And being clear about that, I think is a very, very important point. Now the question is, what are we talking about? You know, when we talk about compassion meditation, compassion training, cultivation, and so on, what are we talking about? Now, this is a very, very broad definition, okay? And I took it from my book that, uh, you know, Rob kindly mentioned. This is broadly defined. Compassion is a natural sense of concern that arises in us when confronted with another's suffering and feel motivated to see that suffering relieved. So this is a very broad definition. And in order to do kind of particularly research, you, you know, for the scientists, it's very important to have some clarity on the construct. I don't happen to be one of those people who genuinely believes that a kid definition can capture, you know, everything exactly as it is, because we are talking about mental qualities, and in the mental domain, edges are always a little fuzzy. So there's an element of some kind of arbitrary boundaries that need to be drawn, because the moment we use language, language works by means of excluding and differentiating con you know, con uh, concepts from each other. So, but broadly defined, this is what we are talking about. So what we see here is when something like compassion arises in us, you know, three things or maybe a couple of more things happen almost instantaneously. One is that we perceive and understand the other's need or suffering in front of us. We make emotional connection with that situation, so you feel moved. Because if you're not feel moved, there is no compassion. So that emotional connection 
and perception of those others and understanding of others' suffering is what people call empathy. So the first part is cognitive empathy. Sometimes it's referred to as the theory of mind or perspective taking. The second part is what generally neuroscientists and emotion researchers talk about empathy, which has more to do with effective resonance or feeling for or feeling with. And then the third thing is that there is a motivation-driven wish element that comes in, wanting to see the situation relieved. Or if, it, if you are a more disposed to compassion and altruistic kind of you know, temperament, you want to do something about it. So three things. One is a perspective taking or understanding the other situation. Second is emotional connection with that situation. Third is wanting to do something about it or wishing to see that situation relieved. So that's essentially what compassion is. So one thing that is very clear here is that compassion is a natural impulse. We don't have to learn to experience compassion. You know, when we are confronted with a situation or a pain in front of us, we, most of us, tend to respond naturally in a kind and compassionate way. So there's, this raises a kind of a paradox. If that's the case, why do we need meditation? Why do we need to practice? Why do we need to train? And this, I think, is an interesting question, actually, a challenge. And I think this, thinking about this question also you know, gives us greater clarity about what exactly is being trained when we say we're meditating on compassion or we're cultivating compassion. So I talked about the secularized versions of compassion trainings have different aims compared to the traditional Buddhist. So I'll just list three very, very broad you know, objectives. One is to become more aware of and connected with our caring and compassionate nature. And that is the presupposition that this program is based on, that there is a kinder part to ourselves. And you know, yesterday, uh, Richie and uh, um, uh, Matula talked about that, the, you know, the basic goodness and all the rest, but it talking, you know, we're talking about that. Second is to nurture and develop this part of us so that we can make compassion an important part of our outlook or perspective on life and the world. And third is then to learn to relate to ourselves, others, and the world around us from a place of understanding and compassion rather than that of excessive judgment. So the goals are pretty realistic, you know, quite modest, but one could also say quite ambitious as well. So, and number of studies have been done. I think Philippe Golden is here and Huria uh, Jazeri. Um, the, they are, these are the two scientists who have done most amount of research on the effects of CCT. Um, so I'm not going to uh, talk about the studies, effects of the studies, Philip, and both of them are here. You can ask them. But it seems there seem to be quite a robust effect on in those who take the compassion training to have a more healthy emotion regulation strategies, which I think is very important because it has health and mental well-being implications. And also, uh, particularly for men, um, you know, by taking the classes and doing the meditation seem to reduce fear of compassion. And Paul Gilbert has developed a fear of compassion scales, and probably that makes sense because most of the guys are kind of little, you, you like to feel that you're in control. So, um, so that's an interesting one. And then um, the other one is, the, 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 it's not published yet, but the results are quite interesting. Uh, this is Philip's work uh, and, and Huria as well, that somehow not just taking the classes but actually doing the meditations in that particular day seems to have a real impact on how self-compassionate you are. So if you do the meditation in that day, there seems to be at least three to five times more chance that you're going to do something kind to yourself. So I think, sorry, um, something kind to others, but you know, six to seven times more towards yourself. So the effect on self-compassion seemed to be quite strong. And the effect on self-compassion seemed to be particularly strong on women um, you know, participants. Uh, and also effect on the reduction of symptoms about anxiety and depression. Again, seems to be much, the effect seems to be much stronger on women. So we don't quite know at this point, you know, is, you know, our program is very generic. It's not developed for any specific constituency. 
but there might be something in here which we could look at, maybe different elements which have certain gender kind of you know, disposition or we don't know. So now in the traditional approach, I would identify three main areas that are the focus. One is for the traditional compassion meditation, a very important part of that is to have a deep understanding of suffering based on meditation on suffering. There's a, if you look at the traditional text on compassion, there are massive detailed descriptions, descriptions of sufferings of animals, hell beings, human beings, and so on, like detailed, detailed. And the suggestion is that you should reflect upon these sufferings as if you are yourself undergoing them. So understanding suffering, and particularly causes of suffering, is really a key part of the traditional approach. And so, you know, one, by reflecting upon suffering, you are learning not to resist, but keep your mind, heart open to the experience of suffering. The second element is establishing a feeling of connection or identification with others. And the third is priming our heart and mind through heartfelt aspirations. So this is you know, in the form of wishing phrases, may you be happy, may I be happy, and so on and so forth. So these are the three, really the key elements. And a large effort in the traditional practice is really spent on the second one as well. And here, there is a term called yi wong, which is very difficult to translate in any single English word, but it really literally means, you know, cultivating your perception so that others, you know, appeal to your mind, that you hold others to be dear, you value others. There's a appreciate, genuine appreciation of others' sentient nature. So this is close that it comes to empathy, but I would argue that the active ingredient of that is the ability to identify with the other. That really is the key. Now, in order to attain this, in the traditional practice, the first stage is really equanimity practice. And it's a very radical practice which involves leveling, the, leveling out the field. And in secular programs, particularly in Stanford, we don't use it it's because it's quite radical and it could be mistaken. You know, there are two ways in which you can level out. One is to you know, be disinterested even in your loved ones, <laughs> towards your loved ones, so that everybody is on equal level. That's not the way we want to go, you know? <laughs> so the, the initial stage is to really, and, and the thing that the, init, the, the, the Buddhist practice is struggling is how to rise above our natural impulse to discriminate others the in-group and out-group, as the scientists talk about. This is a very natural tribal instinct that we have. And in order to get to this you know, non-differentiated universal compassion, somehow you have to overcome this. And the way to do that at the initial stage is to just level out. And then once you have leveled out, then you start establishing a new basis for reconnecting with others. So the Buddhist practices generally start from this equanimity practice, which is actually very radical, and not many people appreciate this. Now, in the secularized version, it's done just slightly differently. We begin with opening our heart through loving kindness for a loved one. So loving kindness meditation. We don't start out with this radical leveling out. So what we are trying to do is to you know, use the resources that are naturally there, that most of us are capable of feeling genuine love and compassion for someone who, whom we care. And we use that resource to make ourselves more aware of that quality in us and open our heart. And in our you know, text, we use the word, moisten your heart. And this is beautiful because there is a, a beautiful imagery in one of the Buddhist texts which you know, uh, compares equanimity to a field, soil, and loving kindness as the moisture, and compassion as the seed, and altruism as the, the tree coming out of it. So loving kindness has this role of moistening our heart. It's like softening it, opening it up. And this is, you know, done through, you know, loving kindness to a loved one. And then the middle one is the same as in the traditional, but less radical, but we, what is happening in the modern version is basically you are starting from where you are, which is your ability to care for someone you love, 
and you get more and more aware of that feeling, you appreciate that, you cultivate it, you enhance it, and then you open your heart, and then you start beginning to use it, simply changing the focus. So it's like a kind of expanding the circle of concern. So it doesn't require this radical cleaning up first. <laughs> it's a softer approach. And then the third element is the, is the same. So I think it's important to remember this because sometimes, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with people actually using the traditional equanimity practice so long as they are aware the radical nature of that and the role it has to play in establishing the foundation. So in the secularized version, we tend to use a much more gentle approach. So what then are the targets of change? You know, because if you are doing meditation, it's a form of mental training. You want to achieve something, although Buddhists are supposed to be not attached to the goal. Uh, but, you do, but to be inspired to do something, you do need to have some kind of goal. Uh, and so what are the targets of transformation? One area is awareness and presence. And this is kind of main meditation practice, all of this mindfulness, all of this, really cultivate that as aspect. And I use the word presence because Tanya Singer, uh, one of the main researchers on basic meditation on the effects of compassion training, has done a very, very important nine month long you know, compassion training based or longitudinal study where she divided the compassion meditation into three components. She calls one presence, that's more to do with the mindfulness type qualities. The other one she calls it perspective taking which is more the common humanity practice. And the third one, she calls it the effect training, which is more the loving kindness and compassion. And what she has done is very cleverly, she had two groups of trainees. They all began with the same you know, training. And then from um, the, the next segment, she ch changed the order. One group got perspective taking first and effect after. Other one got effect training first and perspective taking later, and then the results are going to come out very interesting. It does show that the, it uses different brain regions and effects were quite different. So, so that's why I've used that. And another area is really outlook and perspective uh, we are trying to change because we want to change the way we see ourselves. We, you know, we, we want to change the way we see others and the world around us. That's really in the Buddhist tradition, we call it the view, but it's really the, your perspective. And then intention is very important in the compassion training. Um, in the end, you want to change the way in which you feel motivated to do things, but motivations are much more complicated things to get at directly because they tend to be generally in the emotion domain, uh, whether it's drive or you know, incentive driven, whatever it is. But so by working at intention, which is a more conscious mental state, where you have some say, you change also the motivation indirectly. So that's a very important part of the target. And then empathy, you know, it's not so much, what we are trying to change here is, you know, the scope of your empathy. Empathy is a natural quality that we have, but we generally, we tend to reserve it only for the ones that matter to us. And for strangers, we use it only when the stranger is in acute pain in front of us, bleeding, then we are able to cut through all that divide and you know, just directly connect with the person. But most of the time, we tend to reserve empathy for you know, people who, who we think deserve it. So you are expanding that scope. And then in the end, you know, we are interested in behavior and habit because if all of these changes, you, know, you focus, but in the end, if it doesn't manifest at the final level, it doesn't really mean much. I mean, if, unless you're a meditator hermit alone up in the mountains, then of course it's something else. But so long as you're living in, the, in society, then it really has to make an impact there. And here sometimes people who take meditation seriously really sometimes don't appreciate the importance of this final. In the end, that's the test. That's the test of the pudding. It's in the, really in there. And sometimes um, you know, the meditators forget that. So these are really the target of practice, you know. And I think what is 
called for is to have some understanding, particularly if you compare mindfulness meditation to compassion meditation. Compassion meditation is much more messy. There are a lot more moving parts, you know. It's, it's not that clean. And also, but on the other hand, the advantage is that mindfulness is not a natural quality. You have to cultivate it, the skill, at least in the way in which the modern mindfulness, metacognitive awareness skill we're talking about. C compassion is a natural impulse. And it's also tied directly with intention. Also, it ties with our ethics, the way we treat others, the way we live in the world. So it's a much more messier uh, you know, kind of undertaking but also it's very directly related to our emotional life. So if we are able to make any changes through the training, the changes can have a much larger impact in our life. Because if we can cultivate ourselves to be a kinder you know, person who is able to relate to the world from that place of compassion primarily, it completely changes the story. You know, you just have to look at the way His Holiness you know, relates to the world, the way he treats people. You know, whoever he meets, the first, at the first instance, he would relate to this other person just at the human level. And it's a beautiful you know, quality. And this is one of the reasons why people who have had a chance to encounter with him, they come back completely transformed because probably for the first time in their life, they must have experienced someone who is there fully for you completely present, who values your presence there. So I think that kind of, and it's, it's an acquired quality. You know, he has cultivated it. And, it's a, and we are all capable of doing this if we spend some time. Um, so then what is the basic, oh my goodness. Um, I'll just list this here. <laughs> OK? So the arrow initially is one direction. But at some point, then the arrows really go everywhere. It's a much more dynamic process. So I want you to you know, uh, keep this in mind. Um, so I'll skip this and um, just write that. But <laughs> because I want to have some questions and answers. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to conclude by saying that even though I said that the secularized programs have a very modest and less ambitious objective, but that does not make them really ambitious. I mean, you know, less ambitious. It's really, what we are seeking here is a kind of training, a practice that would really bring about fundamental transformation of who we are, allowing us to be able to live a life where our everyday life and our thoughts and emotions are, will be in much more in sync with the kind of larger aspirations and values we have in our life. So that the, the resources that we are naturally possess, which is that impulse for compassion, instead of leaving it at the mercy of being triggered by a situation, which is what happens to most of us, we can actually make it a more proactive part of us, make it a standpoint from which we relate to the world, so that it it is basically the first position from where we will treat others, where we will relate to the world, where we will see the, you know, see the world around us, and also make compassion part of our everyday intention so that it has a chance to shape and influence and organize the very principles that guide our life. In this way, you know, at some point in this kind of practice, we can make compassion not only an emotion, and a quality, you know, ethical quality, but in fact, the very way of being in the world. And wouldn't that be beautiful? Thank you. <laughs> so um, we have about f five minutes, so maybe one or two questions. Thank you. Go ahead, yeah. Is that mic on? Can you switch that mic on? I'm trying. Oh, okay. <laughs>
Yeah, because you can shout. Yeah. It, it's, it's a little slide. It's a little slider, on the button. Slide it towards the mic. Can I ask a question while he's collecting? <laughs> well, why yeah, don't you yes, go ahead? You, yeah. you, 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 thank you very much. And um, you're using the word empathy as actually part of compassion. And I wonder if you can talk about some of Singer's work that looks at maybe empathy and compassion as different pathways sure, and, sure. That, and a more sustainable sure. and less, yes. Yes, um, I think I would argue that uh, without empathy, I think it's very difficult to have compassion because you have to make the emotional connection with the situation in front of you. But empathy is more of an emotional character, but compassion has a much more active motivational component. So, um, so compassion is in some sense a more complex mental process. It includes the understanding of the situation, being moved emotionally by the situation, but also then having some of this active component. So, and that's, that's why Tanya Singer's research is potentially very important because what she's doing is she's really teasing out the distinction between empathy and compassion, and she has the brain data to really now to show it. And it turns out, and it makes sense because when you are in empathy, focus is kind of predominantly about the problem and the situation and your own experience of it. But when you are in a compassion, focus also includes kind of a seeking a solution. So it's a much more empowered state um, you know, to be in that. So I think it will have some important implications. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, so I just. Yeah, 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 yeah. You got a, you got a nice and loud voice. So. Your talk reminded me of something Buddha Ghosh says about compassion. He says it's the capacity of the heart to break when you see the suffering of another person. And I was also reminded of the fact that, uh, you know, if you were to give me news that some terrible tragedy had befallen a close family member, I'd be very upset. But if you told me that 10,000 people were killed across the country or in another continent, I would. That would sure. be a statistical sure. piece of information sure. for me. I would struggle to sure. be able to relate to that emotionally. And so my question for you is, I wonder if we might be foregrounding compassion too much and that we might be needing other skillful emotional states like loving kindness and sympathetic joy, and you mentioned equanimity, and that these things need to work together as a package, not just in traditional practice, but sure. in more mainstream practices so that we avoid things like empathy fatigue. Sure, thank you. That's a very, very good question, actually. Um, uh, if you look at uh, most of the secularized programs, you know, the, the loving kindness is there. You know, I'm in the Stanford Compassion Training. We have loving kindness for a loved one, loving kindness for oneself. You know, because the way in which, you know, at least I see the distinction between loving kindness and compassion is more about the focus. If you are focusing more on wishing others well and their well being and happiness, it tends to be on the loving kindness side. If you're focusing more on you know, wishing others free from pain, free from suffering, and if you're moved by the side of a suffering, you tend to be on the compassion side. And they're really, really, you know, at the basic level, they're the one and the same thing which manifests and expresses in a different way. So um, I don't think we need to worry about too much focus on compassion. We tend to use the word compassion a lot more because the sources of these kind of programs are Tibetan, practices, and in Mahayana Buddhism, compassion is front and center, and other kind of, you know, uh, four, uh, the other three immeasurables are really seen as kind of a complementary factors in the service of compassion. So um, I take your point, but I think most of the programs do take a much more balanced view. Uh, and, um, you know, I think in compassion, um, there is, um, I mean, the, 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 the way to deal with the empathy fatigue and burnout is to really focus more on being able to distinguish between empathy and compassion, because compassion is a more empowered state. And empathy also has a tendency sometimes, if you find yourself in a situation where you can't do anything, that you, it turns into a personal distress, and nobody wants to be distressed, then you switch off. So then a kind of a denial and suppression kind of mechanism kicks in. Uh, whereas if you are able to you know, shift to compassion, 
And then one of the beautiful things about compassion is that it teaches us that sometimes the problem may not have a solution. And we are, you know, and that what it calls for is the ability to be with the suffering, be open to it, and, you know, to really let the other person know that you are there. So I think these will, that's why in the tradition, the, the emphasis is made on combining compassion with wisdom. Thank you. Hello. Oh, sorry. Am I next? Um, so thank you so much um, for speaking here. It's such a privilege to hear you speak. Um, I kind of have a question related to kind of what you were getting at just now. So, um, you know, given the events of, you know, this past week, um, you know, I was trying to comfort a friend who was really having a difficult time trying to deal with reality. And um, I was, you know, and she thought that I was trying to, you know, while I was trying to comfort her, she thought that I was trying to say that nothing is kind of wrong or, you know, it was sure. really hard for me to get through to her. And so I kind of, you know, I kind of tried to engage with her on her level, but at that point, and when I did that, I was able to get through to her a little more. But then I ended up kind of sacrificing some of my cool. <laughs> you know, I ended up kind of uh, being a little resentful toward her afterwards because now I was in a place of like, you know, okay, well, <laughs> all right. Um, and um, so I guess how can, you know, with this perspective taking thing, is are there certain boundaries? What are the boundaries that we need to be setting? Are, is that something that we should be doing? Or when you practice enough, maybe those boundaries, you won't even notice them. You'll just be able to directly engage or... Um, how do you kind of not put yourself into a suffering state of mind in order to achieve that empathy? Thank you. That's a very, very um, important question. Actually, talking of being depressed, my uh, uh, younger daughter, it turned out, I was in, actually in Moscow um, on the election day, um, but it turned out that my younger daughter stayed up until 3 o'clock Eastern Standard Time um, to watch the whole thing. and. When I came home um, yesterday, um, the day before yesterday, she and her, my elder daughter too, they were pretty depressed actually. Um, and um, you know, I was myself in a state of shock. I, I thought something like this would never happen, but it did happen. Uh, and probably many of us probably were in a state of denial. We, we just didn't fully understand the extent of people's anxiety and wanting change. Uh, of course, there's a fear dimension to that. Uh, but for your specific question, the more general question about how do you draw the boundaries, um, this is a difficult one. Um, I think, you know, sometimes people, when they talk about empathy, they tend to think that empathy only involves resonating the other person's distress or sadness. Uh, this is feeling with. Empathy can take the form of feeling for without getting to this other level of feeling with. And this is easier said than done, but there is a way in which you can do it so that you are really feeling for this other person and indicating to this other person that you are there, you know, you are supportive, but you create a boundary, uh, you know, between yourself and that actual experience of the pain. Uh, so these things probably also involve an uh, element of practice and you become more and more kind of, at some point, you don't want to be consciously trying to draw the boundary, you know? The ideal way is to cultivate yourself so that it comes kind of naturally. Uh, and I see that with His Holiness. You know, he's a master at it. You know, he's able to switch modes like this. You know, at one point he will be deeply, deeply there, you know, just for someone listening in total empathy, and the next thing you know he's in another state. I mean, so that kind of flexibility of mind will come through more of a familiarity and practice. Thank you. John. Hi, Jimbala. Hi, thank you so much. I just felt, I felt it, and I thought I felt in the room as well, when you didn't go into any of the theory of change elements, I, uh, a kind of a desire for that. And so I was just wondering if, even, even just a little bit briefly, if, if you could just uh, name a few of those uh, theory of change elements and just say a little bit about them. Um, can, you, can, can I have the slide back? Excuse me, can I have that slide back? 
Yeah. This is a kind of a more general theory of change in the Buddhist understanding. So go ahead. So the question. Just uh, this basic theory of change is for the compassion training that you're doing from Stanford, right? Uh, could you just say a little bit about what those, even just a few of what those components are, how that, how you understand the components working together in a theory of change here? Well, um, the perception is where we, this is the common humanity practice. Basically, we are trying to change the way in which we would see others. So this is really getting to this fundamental level of recognizing shared humanity and our equal vulnerability to pain and so on. So that is change at the level of outlook, the way we see others. And that leads to the change in our attitudes as well as values. So it's kind of part and parcel of that. And then once we have change in our perception and attitude, that also tends to affect how we feel about others. Generally, that's the idea. So then it affects our motives, feelings, and so on, which then affects the way we behave. So this is the kind of Dhammapada idea, you know, the, you know, with your mind you create your world kind of idea. And then once we start behaving in a particular way and repeatedly, at some point, habit comes to be formed, and that changes the way. So that, so that eventually we want to get it to the point of where compassion becomes a habit. So that really is the idea. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jinpa. So leaving the slide here for a moment, I'm very interested in something that Richie Davidson mentioned last night, and that's the relative impact of practice and intention in processes of change more at a group level than an individual level I've been in my work trying to move towards working with intact groups. So I would be very interested in your comments on where traditional mindfulness or compassion practices are in your theory of change and how that relates to intention. Mainly because I see many people who have practiced a long time who aren't transformed in the way his Holiness and some of the wonderful teachers are. Thank you. Um, there is a beautiful um, kind of a, a in, in a saying in one of the Tibetan Kadamba masters. They say that um, um, for the Dharma practice to be effective, the Dharma practice has to be integrated in your personality. And if there is a, a space wide enough for a, a person to pass through between your practice and your life, nothing is going to change. So this ability to integrate, and therefore, I think in, in compassion training, I think, you know, although because it's derived from Buddhist practices and it's contemplative practice, people tend to take the sitting sessions very seriously, but equally important are the things that are happening beyond the sitting session. So in the Stanford Compassion Training, we have something called informal practices. And this is taking the inspiration from the Lojong line slogan, which says that whatever you encounter in your day, bring it into your practice. And until we are able to get to that stage, the effect, efficacy and effectiveness of these kind of practices in the larger domains of our life will be limited. So you really have to find a way to kind of integrate your sitting states of mind with the everyday life, with a very conscious intention set right at the morning the beginning of the day, so that there is a kind of a tone that carries throughout the day that really has a larger background. So the transformation of mind that is understood in this kind of practices is a quite a complex one. It's not a one size fits all or you know, one bullet gets everything. It's from a multi-pronged approach. And this is one of the reasons why His Holiness often says that for him, you know, he would suggest people take analytic meditation more seriously rather than just thinking meditation is a form of emptying your thoughts and quietening the mind. So you need to combine both and the analytic approach is something that you can do on a daily basis. So I think, you know, so often what happens is that people take the sitting session so seriously and they feel that somehow, you know, without the sitting sessions, nothing can really make a difference. So I mean, I do only half an hour in the morning. You know, and then the rest of the day, I try to remember and keep that kind of intention 
as much as possible present, especially when there is a challenging situation. If you have set the intention, you, are, you have a much greater chance of being able to recall your kind of, you know, your stand. stand. And this is because you have set this conscious intention. So, and this is true in many things, you know, whether you are parenting, whether you are, you know, uh, leading a group of people, you know, the more in intention you set, the more chances you have of being able to recall at a challenging moment what you are supposed to do. So it's, it's a complex process. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think we might have to uh, stop after two. No, uh, yeah, okay, and then, excuse me, so because people have to go for lunch and then the next talk is at one o'clock, so sorry. I was, I was wondering if centering so much on suffering is a little bit negative. Uh, in the secular world, uh, people are concerned about avoiding suffering, but they're also concerned about pursuing happiness. And this is a more positive outlook. It's looking for something. So I wonder if instead of just focusing so much on compassion, we should also develop attitudes and emotions that are feeling joy when other people feel happiness. And some people call this new, this new attitude, this new emotion, compersion. So I wonder if we should also balance compassion, which is centering only on the, on the suffering other, and also realize that there is also the happy other, and, and that way uh, turn our life a little bit towards more a positive outlook and avoiding suffering and looking for happiness. Thank you, that's a very, very good question. In fact, I would strongly recommend a new book that just came out collaborated between His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu called The Book of Joy. I saw that it's being sold out there. Uh, you are very right, but on the other hand, suffering is there. Whether we acknowledge it or not, suffering is part of who we are, and in fact, I would argue our capacity to experience suffering and recognize suffering is what defines us as sentient. Uh, and it's a very, very fundamental natural impulse. And this is the reason why we are perfectly capable of feeling strong compassion for a total stranger in the face of a very, very painful situation because it's, it's the connector. We're able to identify with this person. So the idea behind the compassion training is that we develop a healthy attitude towards suffering. It's not a morbid obsession with suffering. It's really a healthy attitude towards suffering so that our resistance to suffering doesn't come in the way. Because often, you know, a large part of the problem is not so much the painful situation, but our reaction. And our reaction makes us stumble. And that, then everything gets topsy-turvy. Whereas if we are able to develop an attitude, a standpoint from which we relate to these situations and be with the suffering, observe it, then we have, you know, and, and this, there is, this does not preclude the element of joy. And in fact, one of the very important insights in the Buddhist psychology is that to be able to sustain your motivation to practice on a regular basis, you need to have an element of joy in your practice. And every parent who has struggled to have their children learn a musical instrument or a, a sport will tell you it's tough at the beginning. You have to take them every week to the classes, make sure they're crying, you argue with them. And then you get to a point when they master it, they love it, they enjoy it. You don't have to do anything. They will do it for themselves. So I think this is where I think, you know, sometimes, and it may be more to do with Christian heritage here, because sometimes we, you know, a lot of Westerners tend to think that if it's not painful, if it is, if something is not right, it's not pure, you know? So, and you shouldn't be enjoying this kind of, you know, if, it's, if there is an element of joy, something is kind of tainted. This is probably a cultural kind of, you know, uh, issue. But the Buddhists would uh, insist, yes, you need to bring an element of joy. Because without joy, you cannot just purely rely on the power of self-will. Will can get you only up to a point. But then you get exhausted. So you want an effortless, you know, attitude and practice, and approach to practice, and joy is the one that's going to bring in. And people forget that. Oh, thank you for reminding. And there's a book out there, too. Okay, last question, and then that's it, yeah. 
Thank you very much for your presentation. I find myself moved both by your presence and your words. And yet at the same time, I find myself with a deep skepticism about how well the approach that you've outlined will meet the stated objectives, which I find to be quite ambitious, not modest, uh, of the Stanford Compassion Training. And specifically, I find myself with skepticism about the face validity of uh, how you are engendering people to identify common humanity in terms of changing their perception of what may be occurring within the kinds of struggles that they identify within their daily life. And so I hope you can kind of disabuse me of that particular skepticism. And then the second point uh, that, I'm, uh, that I'd like to make is that I am somewhat worried with the focus on avoiding a personal distress uh, as a feeling. Sure. Um, and uh, the, the people that I see who are out in the world making a lot of change actually exhibit high levels of personal distress sure. about sure. injustices. And yet, uh, they're able to ground it in a way within community and within social relationships in a way that they're able to engage in highly motivated and highly structured behavior. And so I wonder about how we could potentially study uh, you know, how to do that and how to use our mindfulness or meditative or even compassion-based practices to facilitate that kind of engagement as opposed to purely focusing on sitting back and generating a positive feeling that might evidence itself in some behaviors. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you for the two questions. I think the personal distress, um, even in empathy, strong empathy, there is an element of distress, feeling of unbearability, because once you are moved by the situation, you are going to feel some distress, and that's the trigger for compassionate action. But sometimes what happens is that when you stay in that personal distress too much, then the focus becomes yourself, not the other, not the situation. And that's the situation we want to avoid. And here, kind of having some understanding of the distinction between empathy and compassion might actually help. And also, in the long run, if you are not able to somehow fine tune the distinction and stay more in the compassionate zone rather than distress, the chances of being able to sustain your effort in helping others is going to be much less because being caught in an emotional zone is exhausting. You know, emotions are not meant to be long lasting. Emotions are there for an evolutionary reason. They are there as an important signals in your life and then you're supposed to deal with the situation. So I think I, I take your point. I was not suggesting that we avoid personal distress because you know, if compassion involves facing the suffering, being with the suffering, it's already there, you know, you can't avoid it. The other question you um, asked, um, I think what we, the reason why I called it less ambitious and modest is because we are not expecting through the programs like this that people will come out feeling compassion for the whole world. Because feeling compassion is much harder than adopting a compassionate attitude, okay? We can learn to develop a compassionate attitude towards others, compassionate attitude towards the world by changing the way we see the world. But feeling is a much harder thing to do because it has to follow a certain kind of disposition. So, and the idea here is that you learn to view others in such a way that your initial encounter with someone you will relate at that human level. And then the situation may call for some other means to deal with the situation, but that is something else. But generally, most of us tend to relate to others right from the beginning, you know, through the labels. You know, he's so and so, he's important, he's not important to me, you know, who is he? You know, we tend to relate really at that labels level. What compassion training is suggesting is that we can learn to relate at this first initial instance at the fundamental human level. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.